Good morning, all beautiful people. Cycle 47. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Tom. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Tom. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good so morning. we have a lot to cover this morning. I was playing for you the great song, I'm Sticking with the Union, uh, that was recorded for Pete Seeger's 90th birthday party at uh, Madison Square Garden from 2009. I put the link in the chat. You can enjoy it anytime you want. It's one of the great organizing songs and appropriate for our guest meeting, uh, who's coming uh, a little later this afternoon, this morning, Mr. Douglas Hunter. So we have a lot to cover, uh, but we really need to acknowledge the fact that uh, former United States Senator Joseph Biden and former United States Vice President Mr. Biden is now the president-elect, 46th president of, of the United States, along with um, Senator Kamala Harris, the former attorney general of the state of California, will be the next vice president, first a woman of color, first woman, first uh, children of immigrants to be uh, the vice president and be in the White House. Early reports suggest that this was the highest vote, number of votes, voters in history, with maybe 160 million people um, uh, voting. And there's probably more gonna come in because they're still counting. Um, but yet, and yet, that's only 66% of what we call the voting eligible public, that is to say, people who are at least 18 years of, of, of age and who can vote. So we still have 34% uh, of, of people who could have voted, but for some reason did not. Uh, failure to register, um, weren't, weren't interested in the race, uh, et cetera. And that doesn't include several million uh, people who have uh, felony records or who are in prison who cannot vote. Um, but a few things relevant to this class and for our, our, our friends. Um, young voters ages 18 to 29 went for Joe Biden by a wide margin of 61% and were critical in several key battleground states, especially Jordan, uh, Georgia, where uh, the Vice President Biden received 188,000 more youth votes than President Trump did. Let me say that again. Young people in Georgia went for the Democrat Biden by huge margins and may, by some accounts, be the reason why uh, Mr. Biden took Georgia and then maybe the race. Um, also, young people of color went for Biden by overwhelming margins. Uh, black youth at 87%, Latinx youth by 73%, and white youth, not so much, just 51%. Uh, I'm going to put uh, a link in the chat, and you can check a lot of these stats out with nice, nice, nice graphics. Hi, Tom. Yeah. FYI. Good Hi. Good morning. I'm proud to say I have a I had a first time voter. My daughter turned 18 in August, so we I took her to vote for her first time, and we were proud that we had a vice president who was a woman to Lovely. be elected for her first vote. Yes, ma'am. I mean, so many young women, women of color, people of all sorts are inspired by this. Um, uh, and that it, it, it lifts me up, frankly. Uh, I, I had, I was, I was, I was crying like a baby, but I'll just be honest with you, both me and my wife um, for a lot of reasons. Um, and we're going to talk about leadership today. That is today's topic. So we're really on point. Um, we, we could spend really the, our whole session just discussing the election, but sadly, um, we're just, we just don't have the bandwidth or the time. However, as I said before, um, if someone wants to organize a, a separate session, uh, then, and, and I'll respond and we can have a conversation about the election issues, what happens next. You know what I'm saying? Um, there's still a lot on the table um, the president has conceded. You know, there's a lot of lot of thorny issues uh, facing America, but um, but sadly, we just don't have the time to do that in today's class. Um, so first of all, I'll say that uh, the use of the jam boards are going great. So I applaud everyone for your comments from the last session and the session before. Um, and to remind you that uh, all this information, you know, including the videos. Uh, of the two sessions are always here, right? 
So you know where to get them. And the password, of course, is all caps I see stars. So before we plunge into the new content, any thoughts from last session? There's a lot going on, I know. With those young people from the Change the Name campaign. That was one of the first things I wanted to say uh, to you about that. I just wanted to thank you for that because it was just inspirational and it just reminded me <clears throat> a lot of things about how I can just affect change in my own, in my way as well. I mean, it, it, I'm watching children do those things. I mean. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so please feel free to put your comments in the chat right now about your, your reactions to the change the name campaign, um, words, uh, phrases, that would be very valuable for our class record. But sure, uh, inspirational, um, kind of feel humbled, right? <laughs> so what's our excuse? Was, I think someone, someone in the class said, um, uh, age is just a number. I think it was Crystal said that, uh, might've said that in her closing comments, you know, age is just a number. Um, um, any other thoughts? It was definitely a wake up call, um, just, just a reminder of like how, you know, as you know, adults versus children, adults can sometimes overcomplicate things. And mm. sometimes looking at something through a child's eyes or a child's mind makes us realize how much we've kind of deviated from, you know, how we overcomplicate things. And sometimes things aren't, are simpler than, or simpler to approach as a challenge than how we perceive mm. it. Wow, I love that. Could you put that in your chat? That is a great thought. Um, I'm sometimes accused of having a child's mind, <laughs> of being uh, strangely naive or, or, or maybe unrealistically optimistic. But I think I pointed out to you that that is one of the strange requirements of this work, of being unrealistically optimistic. And you can say maybe that's what a child is until he or she is taught otherwise. Um, Mommy, daddy, why dot, dot, dot? Why can't it be this way? You know, and well, honey, because the world is a, you know, we answer from an adult's point of view. But I guess uh, that's an interesting point. Um, the child's optimism, the child's point of view of why can't things be fair or speaking truth, just blurting out things um, is, is somewhat um, similar to what drives uh, this work that we're speaking of. Wonderful. Other thoughts? I was a... Uh... I was just uh, going off, going, just going off what uh, Jessica said. I was really reflecting on it, and I really just wanted to to extend my gratitude to you for exposing us to to those children and exposing us to to the program that that brought this forward. Because you find that it is so um, easy, or it is uh, very eminent in this country or world that whenever children of POC always go out and do something great, not a lot of people know about it. Because if, if these kids, if you had taken their white counterparts and they had done that great thing and changed a whole park name, everybody would have known about it. The whole media would be all over it. <laughs> You'd have interviewers going to these kids and <laughs> asking them questions and being, and uplifting them and, you know, yeah. showing everybody what they did but just because they were black kids not not everybody got to know about it not everybody got to appreciate what these kids did i wouldn't have known about it if you hadn't brought it to us you know and there that park is like a 15 minute drive from me <laughs> right. it's not too far we're in chicago we're in the same city and we didn't know about it you know so that's a, that's, um that's, a that's good one point. thing i was reflecting thank on. you uh, you're welcome i mean the, the, the role of the media in so much of, of, of modern society, politics and civics is, is worth a whole separate class. You know, who tells, who gets to tell whose story, right? You know, the media is owned by corporations that are usually white guys, right? So it's a very important point you make of, of this idea of the media and being able to tell one own story and one owns words. Um, and the history, the hidden history. I think somebody, one of the one of the interns mentioned this several times, the hidden history that is being kept from you. These are awesome points. 
So you can be stewards of your own history and tell your own stories. And as masters of technology, which you all are, you can be all be vital allies to groups like the Change the Name campaign, um, either professionally or, or as volunteers, because all these groups need websites, need media, need social media presence. And so as you move through your careers, wh wherever your journey takes you, you'll have that skill set to offer you know, local groups should you decide to aff affiliate or, or become an ally. Huge. Those children definitely, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. But the children definitely resonated. The children definitely resonated with us. Uh, they stuck with us. And I was going to off what Crystal said. We we have been talking about them. We we speak of them in our teas. We uh, let people know that they they motivated us. So that is a we are we are we probably don't know it, but we are exposing those ch those children and the village leadership academy. We because they did resonate with us. They show a lot of leadership and courage and uh, excellence, and we were proud. So no doubt, yeah. If we keep doing what we're doing, well, and yeah. What you okay, said, so Tom. Mm -hmm. Keep, keep, keep the ball rolling. And again, it's up to you. As individuals, you can go sign up on their website, right? And volunteer. You can send them 10 bucks. You can decide to become a, a volunteer team and teach their kids technology, you know, as tutors, in, informally or formally. The sky's the limit. And I think you'll find willing allies and, and ready acceptance of whatever you want to throw over there, you know, at any time, you know what I'm saying? So work that, you know, uh, nourish that by all means, Sharonda, that's great. All right. So um, what about these young people stood up for you as leaders? Again, throw things in the chat and as well as speak it out. When, when you think of their story and you think of them as leaders, what shows up for you? What shows up? How do they display leadership? Courage. Yeah. Clarity of vision. Great. Future focus. Yeah, tenacity. These are excellent words. Um, empathy. Oh, empathy. Yes. How do they demonstrate empathy, in your opinion? What about their story? Uh, they're concerned for the uh, change in the name of the actual um, statue. It represents how, well, how they feel about the um the neighborhood the um the actual uh park and also whoever will come into the park how would they feel in the future yeah. whether or not it represents uh who they are as a person to them or to their children it's it's like a it's like a act that carries with it the uh effects going forward down down generations so they understand just who will be uh, impacted by their decision that's the kind of empathy that they have yeah it's it, it displayed a sort of a deep listening a reflection of their own selves, like, you know, personally, their, their personal, like, I'm, a, I'm pissed off, you know, in, internally, but also thinking about their neighbors and how, how it would affect them. And I think one young woman said, how does it, how would it affect you to go into a park as a young person of color and, and know this is from a slaveholder? It's not going to make you feel good. And I thought that was, that was an outstanding comment. Um, historically aware is the same idea, this context. They did their history, they researched this. They looked into the, you know, it's not so hard to do, right? Frederick Douglass is huge. He's got, I'm reading his biography right now called Prophet of Freedom, won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, all you have to do is Google his name and yet many people really don't know his story. And they certainly don't know his wife's story, Anna Douglas. Um, let's see, willingness to act. Yeah, that, Lord, that's what- it is Go done. Ahead. The Lord says it is done. For oh. I hear victory, victory, victory. <laughs> Somebody's got their phone on. Um, any other thoughts, how they sh showed up as leaders? Courage, they were courage, they, were, they just said courage, right? And um, creativity, I mean, come on. They did the video, they did the park, things in the park. They did, a, what did they say? They did a coloring book they were able to pivot uh, when COVID came. I mean, that would have shut down, that well, had to have shut down adult organizers. And they somehow were able to take it in with the guidance of their instructor and decide as a group, okay, let's do this. We'll go that way. Uh, amazing. 
All right. Well, the question that we have before the group now, as we move into our discussion of leadership, I want to introduce the concept called servant leadership. And for some of you, this may be a familiar, but for some others, this may be a little new. And we're going to let uh, um, we're going to let um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, Nobel Peace Prize, get, sort of set us up here. So I'll share the screen again. And uh, give me a thumbs up if you can see and hear Archbishop Tutu. Thank you. What, in your opinion, makes a good leader? What qualities? Ah, yes. It's a question that uh, we've had to deal with quite a bit, uh, looking at some of the leaders we have had who have sometimes uh, led their countries into disastrous situations. I think ultimately you want a leader who is also a servant. I mean really uh, the leader is, is a leader because he is a servant. I mean you look at some of the greatest leaders, Nelson Mandela is, is someone who is not in it for his own aggrandizement. He, he leads on behalf of, for the sake of. That is one. And it almost always is that the great leader will show just how he is uh, or she is a, a leader for the sake of the led by suffering. A person who is a servant as well. That is, yeah. that is the ultimate. I, for, for me, yes. That you, you are not one who is seeking self-glorification, uh, who, who wants to feather his nest. Uh, just look, say it at, uh, at, I mean, you can look at Mother Teresa or any, I mean, Mahatma Gandhi, the Dalai Lama. Uh, you'll see that uh, a great characteristic is they are doing something, yeah, sacrificial in a way for the sake of those they are serving uh, and suffering. Well, the Dalai Lama has been in exile for 50 years. Nelson Mandela was in jail. Mother Teresa lives with the poor. She lived with the poor. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, you could go on. Uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, and then the, the great leader is someone who is inspiring inspires his followers, her followers, Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, she said nothing very much for 11 years, and yet she remains the only real leader in, in, in Burma. Uh, why? Uh, that somehow the leader uh, is encapsulates and 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 somehow uh, represents the best that is in the in the people, the aspirations of the people, um, and 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 yes, it is someone who can inspire. Someone who can inspire, someone who represents the best aspirations of those they seek to lead. Uh, so says Archbishop Tutu. Now I'm going to share with you a, a slideshow here. Um, I think you can see it. Do you see that leader serve? Cool. Let's make sure I'm sharing the right screens here. All right. So this is um, the seven pillars of servant leadership. I'm going to go through them very quickly, and then we're going to do some small group work. So um, 
the the servant is the, the, the definition is created by a man named Robert Greenleaf, who started this work uh, some 50 years ago. He says the servant leader is a servant first, with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, one desires to serve. That conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. So you desire, it's the heart first. I desire to serve. And then the brain says, well, maybe I, I have a leadership role here. The best test of this leadership is the following. Do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, freer, more autonomous, and more likely themselves to become servants and servant leaders? Which is an interesting point. One of the things that we say in this work is you have to bring the people up behind you. That's one of the tests of this kind of leadership. It's not all about you. So you may have done a great job in your task as a leader, whatever, whatever that may be, but we're also asking you to help to be mindful of the next generation and to bring the next group upon you to follow you. Um, so said Robert Greenlee, um, the first and most important choice a leader makes is the choice to serve, without which the capacity to lead is severely limited. Now, I ask you to reflect on that because what I see out there in the political realm and, and even in the religious realm, frankly, is the other way around. People desire to dominate and to call themselves leaders and to get power to, 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 to do things and the idea of service is nowhere present or, or very, very slightly present, which to me is the a perversion, it's the opposite. So, um, so we don't wanna be that kind of person. We don't seek power for power's sake. We don't seek um, authority just to lord it over people, you know, to, or as, as Archbishop Tutu said, to feather your own nest, right? Graft, corruption. That is not the kind of leader we seek or, or wish to elevate. All right, here are some of the features of servant leadership. As I say, there are seven uh, parts to this. I'll put those in the chat. And here they are. Um, the first is to be a person of character. And that, that, that you maintain integrity, you demonstrate humility. And as Archbishop said, you serve a higher purpose. Okay, you're a person of character. Two, you put people first. And you do this by displaying a servant's heart. You're mentor minded. Now think about that for a minute. This entire experience that you're running through at IC Stars is all about mentoring. You're being mentored. People are coming in to, to share knowledge with you. And one day you will be mentors if you're not already. And in this uh, distinction here, you show care and concern. Show it, not just internally like, oh, I feel you brother, but you somehow demonstrate it, right? You make it real. That's how you show that you put people first. Here's a one interesting one. You're a skilled communicator. This is required of leadership, but especially in this realm of servant leadership. And here's my, my, again, my favorite word, you demonstrate empathy. So you're already been, you have already meditated on this. We've talked about this several times, the role of empathy in the kind of civic leadership that we wish to uh, front and practice. And you invite feedback. So you're not, you know, you don't take criticism personally, you invite criticism, you invite feedback, you invite learning, you want um, positive and negative feedback about your role and work, and you take it and you you use it. And of course, you communicate communicate persuasively. <clears throat> now, as um, uh, working in IC Stars, I'm sure you've already had many instances where you have to communicate persuasively, either to your own group because you're doing a teamwork, or to the larger class, or even to potential clients. And so, how do you do that? How do you communicate persuasively? Um, when many people are uh, afraid to speak out or afraid to get up and speak with a loud voice. Uh, this is a skill that you must embrace and work on. Um, then you're a compassionate collaborator. And I think those are two great words, compassionate and collaborator. Uh, so again, 
all this teamwork that you're doing, you be, should be mindful of yourself as a team member. So sometimes you're just a team member and you're, you've got tasks and sometimes you lead the team. You've been tasked with sort of organizing the team and pushing it forward. What does it mean to be a great team member and a team leader? Well, one is you express appreciation. And I know it sounds kind of uh, touchy feely, but words of praise, um, honestly given is tremendous. It's like nourishment. And, and, and even though we, we are brainy technologists, you know, to say that, oh, that's a great job. You did a great job with that argument or with that presentation, or you really helped us out in your presentation or your thinking uh, to help us solve this problem. Those words of praise are, are hugely appreciated and deeply nourishing. And likewise, starving people of praise is not good. So, so, you know, if those of you that saw Star Trek or love Star Trek, which, which is I do, I'm an old Trekkie. Remember you had Captain Kirk, who was the passionate uh, leader, thought from the gut, and you had Spock, the calculating sort of computer guy, alien. Well, sometimes you're Spock and sometimes you're Kirk. So, right, and, and what this, this is saying is don't forget your Kirk, don't forget your love, don't forget your show appreciation. You're a team builder. Uh, you build teams, you don't wreck them. And then this last one is an important one. You negotiate conflict. So um, conflict is inevitable in life and it is very present in public work and civic work. So when you are working in, um, you know, even in private, you know, doing your teamwork, there are going to be disagreements. There are going to be headbuttings. So do you have a way to solve conflict in a way that's satisfying? And it's not about shouting someone down, <laughs> turning off their microphone, you know, um, how do you resolve conflict in small groups? This is something that um, maybe you're already working on and it's something you'll see lots of if you go into public life um, and do public work. Um, you are a, someone who shows foresight. This is strategic thinking. You're a visionary. And this again, remember what Desmond Tutu said, the servant leader has a vision, a positive vision to which people respond and gets en people get energized. Um, a vision, a positive vision in our space is not one of negativity and doom and gloom. It could reference doom and gloom, but the positive servant leader is taking us to a better place, has something in mind to replace the gloom and doom, right? You know, to move it aside, to solve it, to repair it. And that vision excites people. It, it brings out, as Desmond Tutu said, the better part of the better, better, the better Nate are better angels. The servant leader in this space displays creativity. So those of you that said, um, you know, when you shared with me, you know, your, your hobbies and you said some of you are writers and coders and some of you are sketchers and do music, all these skills that you have and love are very germane to your leadership skills. And so I encourage you all to pursue your creative endeavors while you're doing your degree, while you're pursuing your professional life. So if you're a musician, do play. If you're a writer, keep writing. If you're a sketcher or a doodler or a, a graffitiist, keep all those skills going. If you're somebody who likes to build robots and work with your hands, yes, by all means, keep those creativity chops strong. They will serve you very well. And then you exercise sound judgment. Again, this is sort of related to these things. You can see someone of character uh, which is our first trait, would rec exercise sound judgment. Um, you're a systems thinker. You're comfortable with complexity. Um, we are, this is a complex world. And as those young people from the um, Change the Name campaign demonstrated, they dealt with a lot of moving parts. The community, the park district, the history of Douglas Park, um, COVID, <laughs> you know, how to approach strangers as a 15 year old, a 13 year old, you know, so many moving parts and they figured it out. It didn't, it didn't defeat them. It didn't, it didn't make them like throw their hands up. They took it piece by piece. You know, you chew the elephant one, one mouthful at a time. And they demonstrated that they were able to handle that complex situation most adroitly. And they demonstrated adaptivity. Of being a, being able to adapt and change and pivot, as they as they told their story, um, it's not a straight line. This work is never a straight line. Life is not a straight line, and social change is never a straight line. Um, if it were, we'd be just be he heaven already. You know, we'd be all, uh, you know, living the good life. 
So it's a crooked path. You start here, you think you're going to go here, oh, something happens, you got to go this way, oh, you got to go this way. And instead of just bemoaning that, you roll with it and you embrace that. And again, for some people, that's hard. It's hard to do. Um, but to be able to, 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 to pivot, take in information, and act swiftly and creatively is a, an, a hallmark of this work. And you consider the greater good. Um, so again, you're always thinking as the servant leader, it's not just about me. How is the community doing? How are we moving forward together in this work? And the final, the final uh, attribute of servant leadership as defined by this particular author is you lead with moral authority. Martin Luther King said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. That is the definition of a servant leader. And which means that your rank is not the thing that is important here. Like in the army, for example, the general gives the, the colonel the order, right? The colonel gives the lieutenant the order, et cetera. The private doesn't give the sergeant the order. That's just the nature of the army. Rank indicates authority. But in this system, authority is granted to the leader by the people. We can recognize someone as a leader and we accede to them and say, we will allow you to lead us. We will follow your lead. And it's a, it's a dialogue back and forth. So we say in this model, leadership to the servant leader has been granted by others. Okay, now I will stop sharing. So what we're gonna ask, what we're gonna do now, ladies and gentlemen, is we're gonna break it into small groups and I'm gonna put um, the tasks here. We'll have four groups. And each group is going to consider one of those aspects. And the four that we're gonna look at is the uh, person of character trait, the skilled communicator trait, the foresight or systems thinker trait, and the leads with moral authority. Okay, so here's the charge to your small groups. We want you to come up with behaviors, markers, that will let you know that someone has one of those, those traits. So in other words, team one, you're gonna put on the jam board, um, what are you looking for from a person? What clue that tells you that Tom Tresser is a person of character? And I put people first. What about me are you looking for? And conversely, what if, what, what if I do something that tells you, ah, he's, he's phony? He's not putting people first. What is that? So that's the task for each of the four groups. And I will put this also in the chat as well. Please use your Zoom boards or your Jam boards, I should say, groups one to four. We won't use Jam boards five and six. Okay, we're just going to throw you right in there. And you guys have been great in the small groups, so I know you can handle this. You will have 10 minutes in your small group sessions. Away you go. Remember, you'll get the pop-up. You accept the invitation to join the small group. Thank you. All right, welcome back, IC Star and Cycle 47, the third session of uh, Civics 101, where we're addressing leadership. Uh, you're all in small group, uh, asked to contemplate aspects of servant leadership. And we chose four particular dynamics. We went over seven, but we chose to focus on four. So group one, uh, you were asked to think about person of character. You have two minutes, what do you got? Um, so we had uh, two lists, uh, 
bunch of character traits they should have versus shouldn't. Mm. Um, they should be sacrificial. They should be able to look at um, serving others without seeing the benefit, some kind of benefit for themselves just for the act of serving others. They should be honest. They should be considerate. They should be direct with their intentions as they express them to other people. Um, they should be able to display uh, commitment, being able to commit to things, optimistic, positive mindset, eager to learn um, either from other people or other places, resilient, not wanting to give up on uh, something they set their mind to. Uh, they should be have some set of moral values as far as um, set for themselves when they engage with other people. As far as don'ts, um, they should avoid self-aggrandizement or being egotistical, not um, being able to check the ego is a sort. Mm -hmm. um, not being arrogant, um, not being dictatorial, being able to share in a space with others and not wanting to take over, not being vindictive or selfish, impatient, or critical enough to others where, you know, other people can't take criticism from this person because it feels like they're mocking them or making fun of them. So. Uh, an awesome set of values. Now, when you said um, a set of moral values, um, would you accept the uh, amplification of consistency? Yes. In other words, I don't, I treat you the same as I treat this one. Correct. Yeah. Or I, I, or, or as you said, the opposite would be, uh, I, I treat you, I like you, so I give you favor, but the next person comes and I don't like them, and I, you know, I give them yeah. a, bad, a bad marking or I treat them unfairly, according to my whim. Right. right? So mm -hmm. it's not about my whim, or like you're my cousin, or my girlfriend, or anything that, 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 is, that drives the, these kinds of points when you're in a leadership position. It's the, it's the merits, it's having a um, policies or other kinds of, um, where, where I say, um, everybody, we're gonna start at 9 a.m. And if you're late, you're gonna be docked $5. Let's say that's a rule. But I'm, but I make an exception for you, Nicoletta, because I like you. But the other guys have to pay $5. You would say, Tom, he's inconsistent. I, you know, I can't trust him, right? So this idea of consistency, I think is great. Um, able to share and not wanting to dominate. Can you talk a little bit more about that one? Um, I mean, it, it's coming from like, when you're in civics, you have to be open to share in a concept with other people, it, especially if you're trying to come from a, a democratic perspective. You're not trying to be a dictator. You're trying to make a, a, a sense of democracy where everybody feels like they have input. And you can't do that if you're coming from a mindset where like my way is the right way or the only way. <laughs> well said. In other words, the servant leader is modeling a democratic behavior, a collaborative behavior, right? A respectful behavior that, that is sort of models the body politic. So it's like, you know, you know, it's you say lead by example. I think that's what I'm hearing you say. And, and one of the ways you do that is by being collaborative, democratic, respectful, inclusive, seeking difference, not just respecting difference. Like I tolerate you, but I value you. I, I, I want your, your spice, right? I want your mojo. That's going to make for a better uh, body politic. That's going to make for a better, better team, right? A better community. And so when you show that as a leader, as a person, Willingly embracing, accepting, communing, going like, what? I didn't know that. Holy mackerel, that's awesome. When you do these things, you're signaling like, I'm not just speaking about these values. I'm living them. I'm demonstrating them. Okay. That's a pretty good list. Group one. Group two, uh, you were looking at a skilled communicator. Talk to me about that. Hi, hello. Um, so... We said that they collaborate well with others by getting them to engage with the task at hand. Mm -hmm. um, they use examples and stories to communicate ideas effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, they are patient when listening to others talk about their issues. 
Um, they're eloquent and articulate. Um, they listen to understand their followers. Mm. Um, they repeat back what they just heard. They're willing to stand with the people they feel have been slighted. Um, and they should have ex eh, eh, intellectual empathy. Mm. Well, that's a good list. That's a good list. Uh, so um, this idea of listening, tell me more about what, how do you know someone is listening? You know, when you could, like they have, for most part, people have facial features uh, or facial expressions, I mean to say, when they're listening, like, like intently, like you could tell that they're focused on every word that you're I saying. Think. Like, right? I'm leaning into you. <laughs> like, like, exactly. Like, I'm leaning into my Zoom. You're, you're not like laid back or on your phone or looking over to your left or right. You're actually paying attention. Like there's visual cues as well as um, there's visual cues because there's also the, and there's also the thing where they, re they repeat what you say. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the times when people are listening, and they want to make sure that they understand what they are hearing, they'll repeat back what you just said. Right. So those are super valuable cues. So you may say, look, I can multitask, right? I can, I can listen, check my messages, and read the funny papers. And you convince yourself that you can do that. But what you're signaling to the person is like, I don't give a crap. Right? You're not worthy of my full attention. So these body language cues are, you know, we're human beings, we're human animals. And we, we, there's a lot of stuff that we go on in our brains that we don't even are, are even aware that we're processing. And one of the things that we process as human beings is these clues that we get from our fellow human beings, right? When we're in, in, in close proximity. And so this idea of listening, leaning, you have my eye contact, as you say, but then also the behavior is I repeat it. So not only did I, do I look like I'm paying attention, but I actually remember what you just told me. So I'm asking you for clarification, like, oh, Nolan, I didn't understand that. Did you say blah, 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 blah? Or did you mean blah, 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 blah? Oh, okay. Talk to me about that. So now Nolan says, well, Tom heard me, but he wasn't quite clear. So I got I to gotta rephrase. I got to- You know what you just remind me of, Tom? Yeah. When you go to a restaurant and they repeat your order just to make sure that they got everything correct. <laughs> Simple, right? But in in the, and and but think about that in the world of service, if they thought they got it right and they put in the wrong order, like you ask for it medium and it comes back, well done. You you're gonna waste that steak or whatever. You know what I'm saying? You know, it it it's not just a good service, but it's money. It's the economy. So they don't want to go back to the kitchen and ask for another potato because. You 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 said mashed potatoes and they get and they giving you, you know, fried potatoes or whatever. Okay, those are so so. What else? Um, articulate. What is a clue that someone is articulate? How do you know that um, someone displays eloquence? What are they doing? Well, perfect example. Uh, the opposite of me. Um, I, I stumble over words, stumble <laughs> when they don't stumble over words or no, no. they can speak clearly. Um, I would have to correct you there slightly, brother. Um, stumbling over words is not is not necessarily what we're speaking of. You may be you may you may have to take a moment to gather your thoughts. But it's more to the um, what you say. Right. How then how you they have substance to, the, to their to what they want to say, they, they can summarize what they feel or what they have in mind in a, in a proper way where everybody can understand them. It doesn't necessarily mean they use complicated jargon or big words. There you go. It's just that they can get their point across to the person, even if they use basic language, which is actually the best way of doing it. it so I, I was I was once told that if you're going to have a conversation with someone, make it so that everybody, no matter what education, what level of, of understanding they have, that they can understand what you're saying. Yeah, great point. It's simple but clear, not necessarily jargony, right? You don't try to just, you try to not try to drown your, your, your speaker with like uh, your, with your mastery of jargon. That is not what we're speaking about. You can use some jargon as appropriate, but the effective communicator understands their audience. Now, again, that's an example of what? It's the E word. Empathy. That's right. 
So you understand your audience and you, and you gauge your speaking accordingly. You're not speaking down to people, but you're mindful of people. Right? Are you talking to teachers? Are you talking to PhD scientists? Are you talking to kindergartners? Right? Are you talking to your peers where you could use jargon, right? And, and a shorthand language because you're all, you know, been working on the same project. So you're mindful and adjust your speaking accordingly. Okay, that's awesome, guys. Let's go to uh, group three, which was um, foresight, simple systems thinker. Yeah, um, hold on one minute, let me pull it up. <clears throat> so we went with, um, we antici anticipate, anticipate the future, visionary, tackle barriers before they appear, plan ahead, plans for, plans for any possibility, um, sum up with new concepts, come up with new concepts, takes action, has courage, displays faith, thinking outside the box, optimistic, focus on a task, goal-oriented, organized, strategic, and leads effectively. Oh, those are such great words. Um, so your first one right out the box was very fascinating. You anticipate the future. You tackle barriers before they appear. How do you do that? The barrier isn't here yet. How do you how do you tackle something that isn't there? I guess you plan, you make a plan. Okay, and, and in planning, what would be uh, an element that would help you anticipate the future? Imagine the possibilities. What's that? Imagine the possibilities. Yes, yes. Imagination. Also, Based on what? I would say, uh, like going back to the kids from the Leadership Academy, just uh, listening uh, to maybe uh, to your peers, finding out what, if there's a problem or what, you know, if there's a need to take action by listening. I would say that's part of it. I would say based on data. So to be an effective strategic thinker, in order to envision the future, you have to understand the present, right? So you need to know a few things. You need to understand the context of what's going on. You need to understand the trends. So, so data, you need research. Re research, right. When, and, and when I'm saying research, this is what you're researching. You're researching right. um, what is the condition of the thing you're talking about right now and the trend, how did it get here? And what's going to happen if we don't do anything? So in other words, if take it COVID is a great example. If you don't do anything, we know there are gonna be more cases and based on the science and the data. So someone has to be collecting data. That's, that sounds like an obvious point, but <laughs> you know, if we don't collect data then we're not gonna be able to know how many people are infected. So it assumes that somebody's collecting the data on how many people are infected and where they are and how old they are and where they live. And then we're assuming that someone can read that data and figure out what the hell it means. Oh my God, Chicago is going off the chart or Chicago is okay. Or black people in Chicago, horrible numbers or whatever it is. Someone has to be able to look at the data and derive some knowledge from it. Then comes the imagining of the future, right? So there's like three or four steps, you get me? So before you can imagine the future, you got to understand a little bit about the past and where we are. So given that, you can say with the COVID example, it's pretty easy to imagine what would happen if we don't do anything. All those spikes would continue, right? The hotspots would, would, would spread, et cetera. More people would die. And then comes the point of the whole object is to say, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> this is, we're not just an exercise to look at charts and numbers, right? <laughs> to go, oh, that's interesting. 10,000 people caught COVID today. Okay, next. No, the idea is based on that, we, mount, we must do something. Okay, Foresight team, you're, you're, that was cool. Last team before we bring in our guest, group four um, is looking at um, what, is a, uh, what is someone who leaves with moral authority? Okay. Uh, 
we got these eight qualities. Um, one is uh, the ability to uh, listen to the uh, actual uh, needs of the, of the uh, situation. When you're needing to put your moral authority out there, you're actually listening to what is actually being discussed. Um, and the unwavering resolve to actually say what you need to say for your moral authority to not back down, not to change your mm -hmm. opinion. Um, understanding, we, we have to understand how our, uh, what our moral authority is and how, and how it applies to everyone around us. Um, the humility, if, if things go, um, if we can't live up to our, our own view or if there's something that we're missing that we're able to, to, to meet our expectations of the moral authority and get to where we wanna be. Um, the ability to communicate, meaning always say what you need to say, don't be afraid to communicate, um, put your stuff out there and to um, have the voice necessary to say that what is important for the moral objective and the accountability for when you do uh, set out your um, your goals for moral authority, exactly what that does to others, how it would represent what happens in the environment, what happens to the people, what happens to when, when you uh, set your expectations for the community and for your moral objective. And relatability experience are one of two different things where if you if you do have experience in the situation, you can speak to that in order to show how your relation to the moral authority. But if you are looking outside and within and understand what what your purpose is, you can still relate to everyone around you and uh, relate to um, the actual objective of moral of uh, the moral um, uh, like uh, uh, obligation. And so that way you can actually uh, see how it works with others in order to to, to show that the, these uh, things that you're fighting for can. Uh, be appreciated by everyone. Awesome. Um, so you said, you know, an unwavering resolve, uh, but also being mindful of the relationship and the connectivity to the, those that you're leading. So th there's a, there's a saying that you lead from the front, you know, that you're, but, but you're listening, but you're listening to the people while you're leading. So it's a, it's a feedback situation. You're checking in, with your with your peeps, with your peers, with your with your comrades, with your crew, and I have a phrase that I use in my own work. It's called listen, learn, and lead. But lo notice it's not learn. It's not it's not lead first and then listen, right? It's listen, learn, and lead. So that's my personal mantra. That I think I'm what I'm getting from from you, Tony, is that your group reflected a little bit about that. Um, can you speak a little bit more about this idea of being mindful of, of, of the people that you're working with, this, 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 this web of relationships? Well, with regards to the moral authority, you're not, you, you, you speak about what you believe with the moral um, objective, but everyone has a different interpretation of how that moral objective will be applied to them and what it could do. And there's a different perspectives on, on, on the encompassing range of the moral um, uh, outcomes for what what is Im important to us, and we can all add more of uh, a clarity of what will what would be desired and what would be necessary going forward when we're pushing for our objectives. And if we don't get that full range of information, we end up shortchanging ourselves and maybe missing a key element that could help uh, reach better goals or even uh, clear up some uh, issues. And it's just a way of uh, touching every area as, 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 as it comes up, as necessarily to be done because time is moving in a, a, a straight line and things will happen within then, so. So I'm hearing the ability to include, be inclusive, you know, sort of as, as, your part, as part of your operating system, as you're moving forward in time, dealing with all the challenges, whatever the cause is, whatever the case is, you're still listening, you're still got what I call the peripheral vision. And yeah. you'll never know where a great idea will come from to solve a pesky problem. And if you're just saying like, I'm not gonna talk to her, she's the cleaning lady, what does she know? Or whatever, you know, or, um, um, you know, this person is young, she, he just got into the, to the, to the team, you know, he's only 22 or whatever, you know, if you screen people out for, for su stupid or arbitrary reasons, you're, 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 as you say, you're limiting your ability to solve and, and, and um, and right. Not the problem. Yeah, you lose the ability to adapt to changes in time. Exactly. Well, my friends, um, I hope I've given you just a, um, a taste of the aspects of servant leadership. Now we're going to switch gears and bring in our guest, 
Mr. Douglas Hunter. And before we do that, Crystal, will you please introduce him to Cycle 47? Of course, of course, Tom. Um, hi, and welcome again, Cycle 47 Page, Tom, and Dr. Welch to this civic session. Today, I have the honor of presenting to you a gentleman whose story is that of a person who could not stand on the sideline and watch injustice cuff the hands of his community. About six years ago, on Thursday, September 3rd, our guest speaker, Mr. Fudez, will work to rally with an organization called the Fight for 15. Um, about a year later in an interview with the podcast called, called This Is Hell, he was asked the mission, I mean, he was asked a question about the vision and mission statement about the, the movement that he joined and he answered, uh, and, uh, and I quote, yes, we started up, up about two years ago in New York City with 200 workers from about 20 stores that walked off the job. All we were asking for at that time was $15 and a union. Well, we've kind of grown up now. We need more than $15 and a union. We are more of a social justice movement now. We have adjunct professors, we have school teachers, the Chicago Teachers Union, we have students all across the city and across this country standing up. We have people from Black Lives Matter protesting police brutality and the constant shooting of our young people. These people have joined the fight for 15, so we aren't fighting for $15 in the union anymore. We're fighting for social justice in our communities. Now I'm glad to say that this Fight for 15 movement has, is now in 300 cities in the United States and on six continents. It has won and uh, it has won raises for 22 million people across the country, including 10 million who are on their way, currently on their way to $15 an hour. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Douglas Hunter. Uh, now, before I give Mr. I give the floor to Mr. Hunter, I wanted to just mention that after I read through his story, and then borderline stalked him, uh, I discovered a vari variety of inspiring things. But one that stood out the most to me was, even even though he's in his community, he's fighting for justice and equity. Mr. Hunter is committed to his daughter, and he says that as long as she is part of him then all the work that he's doing is worth it. And that, that statement, that alone showed me how great of a man uh, Mr. Hanna is. And with that, I would like to hand over the floor to the amazing Douglas Hanna. Douglas, take it away. You, you're, you've been here before. Please tell us your story and how you got involved in the Fight for 15. Good morning, can I be heard? Am I, is everybody hearing me? Okay. Uh, Man, uh, it's wonderful being here today with y'all, man, you know, as always. Uh, I thank you all for inviting me. Uh, it, coming up, I, I had a lot of faith, you know, but I, I, I had this daughter, you know what I'm saying? And I was, I'm a single parent. And she was left to me, you know, because her mother was killed. And so I was banging, I was doing my thing, but it, I had it, she wanted to be with me. And so I had to clean up my life. That meant I had to go get a real job now. You know what I'm saying? Because she didn't want to live with my mother. She didn't want to live with my sister. She wanted to live with me. And so, and so I wanted to keep her there. And, 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 and that meant I had to get jobs. And, and sometimes it was hard. It was struggling, you know. But I got this job at McDonald's. And uh and I was one of the older guys. I'm, I'm, I'm 59 years old now. I'll be 60 next year. And this was like five years ago. So I was, I was one of the older people working there. I was a maintenance man. And uh, there was a lot of young. Now I'm back. Okay, so uh, I began to, uh, at, while working at this McDonald's, there was a lot of young people there. Uh, struggling, trying to pay bills. You know, a lot of the young ladies had, you know, babies, and they needed to try to take care of their babies. One young lady come to work, and uh, she had newspaper on her daughter. Her daughter was like eight months old, and she had newspaper on her. And that hurt me so bad because, you know, here she is coming to work every day, 
we go to work in McDonald's and we work and we have to smile and, 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 and treat people, you know, uh, uh, with good customer service, but we are hungry and we smelling fries and food all day and we can't eat this food. You know, all we can do is sell it and pass it out. And, and, and oftentimes a lot of us, I went hungry so that my daughter could eat and go to school. I remember one day she came to me and she wanted, she wanted to get a job at McDonald's. And I told her absolutely not because I have seen, you know, the, the abuse that these young ladies go through just trying to provide for their, for their kids. Young men, they're struggling the same way, trying to make ends meet. And so, you know, I, I, I really didn't have nothing to do with that, but the, the, these people started coming around. They were like um, organizers and uh, they were from this fight for 15. And I felt like I was a part of the company. You know, uh, I was a maintenance man. I wasn't a general worker, I was a maintenance man. So I made $9 an hour. You know, everybody else made eight twenty five, but that made me feel like I was somebody, you know? And uh, by me, you know, being the maintenance man, part of my job was slash security too. So when these people would come around uh, trying to talk to the workers, my job was to run them off, to tell them that they couldn't do their organizing here. I didn't know what they was organizing about and I really didn't care. I wanted to be, you know, a, 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 a good worker and, 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 and a part of my company. You know, I felt like I was a part of the management there. And so, uh, these people kept coming around and they started talking to, to the different workers. And uh, the boss got wind, the owner got wind of it. And he was like, well, if I see anybody talking to these people again, uh, they're gonna be fired. And, and, you know, we had different posters hung up in the, in, in the break room, you know, uh, uh, what could be done and what rights we had and different things. And, and, and I've always read that when I was sitting in there. And so I know that we have a right to talk to whoever we wanted to talk to, you know, when we on our breaks. And so uh, I, I withstood that, you know, and he said, when he said anybody would be fired, uh, that hit me in my gut. And so the next time they came in there, I went over and sat down and talked to them. My thing was to let these young people know that they can't be fired just for exercising their right. They have every right to talk to someone. And uh, one of the young ladies that I was talking to, the organizers, uh, kind of asked me to come to a meeting. And, and that was a little too much. I wasn't trying to do all that. I was just trying to, you know, let these young people know that they had rights. But uh, she kept coming around. And uh, eventually I went to a meeting after about maybe a month or so of them coming around. I decided uh, to go to a meeting. I gave them my name and everything. And they told me how nice to be. But when I got to the meeting, it was, uh, it was a lot of people there, maybe about 100, 150. And I immediately dropped my head because, you know, I was afraid. I didn't know none of these people. Uh, and I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know, you know, what their backgrounds were. So they said, well, just sit down and listen. And so I sat down and I began to listen to the different people talk about how they struggle, you know, trying to put food on the table and, and pay bills and, and pay rent and, and, and different things, you know, provide clothing and different things for the kids. And, uh, you know, I, I started to say, well, hey, you know, this sounds pretty much like me, you know? And uh, I went to a few meetings and uh, the more I went to the meetings, the more I was able to start talking and to start telling my story because that's all people were doing. And my story was, I'm diabetic, I got high blood pressure, hypertension, high cholesterol, you know, all these things going on for me. And uh, I got this daughter at home. One night, one night she come in the house and uh, she asked me for $10. And, and you know, I'm, I'm paying all the bills. I'm doing everything. Because if I don't keep a roof over, over her head, they're going to take her from me, right? So I'm doing everything I can to raise her and to take care of her. And, and she came in and she wanted the $10. And I'm like, Serenity, I don't have it. 
and 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 she kept bugging me about it and I yelled at her. I don't have it, you know. And uh she went to her room, she stormed to her room, and uh she came out and went into the kitchen and grabbed the paper towel and went back in her room. I'm being a man, you know what I'm saying? I know it's starting to fit now, but I didn't see that as coming, you know. I just saw her as my daughter and uh because I ain't got no other kids. I've never raised a daughter, you know? So I'm learning as I go along. And, uh, and, and, and I'm struggling really hard trying to make ends meet here. And uh, come to find out, she had just started her period and I didn't know. So I had to get her that. But I felt really guilty, but we would still talk and we talked and uh, she said, well, what are you going to do? What can you do to help this situation? Because I was always complaining. This person is at us. This person is hurting us. This person, these people, you know, and uh, she said, well, what are you going to do? And that's basically how I got started. You know, when that guy come through there and said, that we, if we go to this meeting, if we talk to these people, we're going to be fired. That was it. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, so I went to the meeting and I started talking about me and my daughter and our relationship and how we were struggling. And there was so many other people that are struggling the same way. And, and, and so uh, I said, uh, you know, I got to do something. I got to put my best foot forward to try to help some of these people at least, you know, make enough to be able to survive out here in this world. It's, it's ridiculous that uh, kids are going hungry in this world. And so with that, I just began to organize more and more of the people at my store, you know, and eventually they came to me and it was like, these were the organizers and they were, you know, you, you know, you, we, we want you to be a spokesperson for, for the movement. And uh, initially I was afraid because I got this daughter, uh, I can't go to jail, you know, and, and I, I don't want to get in any trouble because I'm definitely going to lose her. But, you know, what do I have? You know, and, and we struggling so. So my choice was, you know, to pray. And I leaned on my faith heavily to pray and to and to keep going to meetings and to become and to be a, a, a spokesperson for the meeting. Well, initially, well, eventually I was uh, promoted to uh, a national organizer in which I left the city, uh, it was the organizing core of the Fight for 15, and we traveled all over the country, uh, uh, you know, finding out ways and different things that other people were doing and what we could do to uh, grow our movement and to gain as much public attention, to put as much public attention and pressure uh, uh, on this wage uh, disparity as we could. And so uh, that, was, that was awesome. That was awesome. I got to meet a lot of other people. And the more people I met that were like me, the more comfortable I felt and the more a part of something I felt. I, I, I've always felt like I was in life alone, you know, not, not so much as with my daughter and my family, but just loneliness outside of them because I didn't feel like I fitted anywhere. But uh, when I began to give of myself, I, I learned that I fitted in a whole lot of places. And now uh, I'm still one of the national organizers, uh, sitting on the national organizing committee. Uh, we're doing a lot of different things right now, uh, poverty campaigns and, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement. I've also become a part of that uh, and, try, and trying to uh, assist in any which way I can, you know, to try to help. And with that, uh, I guess I'll open the floor up. So, Doug, so, so Douglas is sharing his story, and I want to lift up a few things and see if you can chart this uh, on the chart that we, we have been discussing about the life, the life cycle of change and the go, no go movements. So, Douglas, you said, first of all, the owner said that if anybody spoke to the organizers, they'd be fired, right? Yes. Okay. He, you've also said that you're taking care of your daughter, and you're mindful that if you lose your job, you could lose her. Exactly. So you crossed the parking lot, so to speak, on that afternoon, and you spoke 
to the, the organizer, knowing that you could lose your job. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why? Because I was tired of seeing them young people uh, suffering, you know, and, and not being able to, to make their bills. And, and, and I was in just as big a problem as they were. And so, you know, my thing was something has to be done. And uh, these people kept coming through there saying, we can help, we can help if you all stand together, you know. So, so my mission became to try to get them to stand together so that we could get some help. Uh, one of the things people would get burned in, in you know, in working with this hot grease and, and grills and different things. And uh, we, we had no first aid box. The owner would tell us, well, if somebody gets burnt, put some mustard on it. Some mustard, you know, come on, get serious. I, I mean, people need medical attention. And so, uh, you know, after seeing things like this here and young, young ladies uh, having, you know, to be sexually abused by management, you know, in order to keep a $8.25 an hour job, I thought that was ridiculous. You know, nobody should be treated like that in order to pay, you know, and to take care of their kids. You know, I have a mother too, and my mother struggled and she left the house and I don't know where she went, but I pray to God that she didn't have to go through what I saw some of them young ladies have to go through in order to be able to feed their kids. And so I, I began to become committed to making something happen differently in, in, in these Ruston ranks uh, because it was happening all over the city and all over the country. And that's an amazing thing. Thank you for sharing that because as we've discussed many times, most people would not have crossed the parking lot. Yeah. And they, they would have seen the same things you saw, they experienced the same things you, you experienced, but they wouldn't have done it. And so the, f the first thing we thank you for is for crossing the parking lot. But then you mentioned you went to the meeting, kind of reluctantly, because they, they were pestering you, right? Yeah. <laughs> but that's what the organizers do, you see. From, from the point of view of the organizers, they're looking for you, Mr. Hunter. They're looking for the Douglas Hunters of the world. And when they see one, they know it. And they go, oh, we can't let this guy get away. So we're going to kind of bother them. And, you know, they were probably texting you and saying, hey, we'll drive you to the meeting, right? Yeah. Oh, I gave them my phone number. Big mistake. <laughs> yes. <laughs> big mistake. organizing your phone number because they never stop calling. That's yeah. right. So the good organizers, you know, know, to, you know, to kind of push it a little bit, maybe. But this is not normal behavior, ladies and gentlemen. What we're talking about here is we don't know how to how do we train for this? How do we prepare for this? So it's, it, was, it makes every sense that Mr. Hunter would not answer the phone or not answer the text or say, no, thanks, I'm busy, you know, for that night, uh, whatever, you know what I'm saying? That's the end. But you did go. Talk to us a little bit about that moment. As you say, you went in, there's like 150 people. What, what, what went through your head? Well, initially, it was a lot of fear. You know, what's going to take place, you know, uh, Am I going to fit in? You know, just the social fears that, that, that goes along with meeting a, a lot of people. But like I said, it was a lot of uh, shame when I initially went in there because I was struggling. And, and, but, but I didn't know at the time that all these people in this room were struggling just like I was struggling. I mean, we would, I was there with them. But initially in going in there, you know, it was, it was a real shameful feeling because I felt so alone. You know, because I hadn't heard anybody's stories. I didn't know that they were dealing with a lot of the same issues that I was dealing with and seeing a lot of the same things that I was seeing. And uh, after the first meeting, I knew that I was kind of like at home, that these people were experiencing life pretty much like I was, and, and it wasn't good. And, and, and I wanted to do something about it. And I think that want and the desire to do something about it brought me back you know, to another meeting. And, and, and as, as that commitment has grown, uh, so too have my, a lot of my activities in the movement. I want to point out to everybody that, that this idea of being alone is, 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 comes from our socialization. It comes from our culture. It comes from the way society has set us up to make us think that we're alone. And it doesn't help us make these connections. And so it's a courageous act that Mr. Hunter's talking about when he goes into this meeting feeling like, oh man, I would just, I'm, little, I'm just gonna go right out of here. I'm passing through this meeting. I have, this meeting is not for me, blah, blah, blah. He could have done that. 
Instead, he stayed. And then it's the storytelling that some of you have already talked about, the importance of stories, to listen, to tell your story, to be able to, to be in a room with others and, and say, I am not alone. The troubles that I've been experiencing is not my fault. It's not because I'm inferior or weird or, or, or lack skill or something. There's something going on here. Isn't that true, Mr. Hunter? Did you start to feel this, there's a big picture? I got to learn about the big picture, right? And McDonald's and all like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like when, you, when I came into the room, I was in a room with whites, blacks, Latinos. Everybody is suffering the same way. You know what I'm saying? And so, and so now I have something in common with these people. You know, it, 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 it was broader than, you know, a, a black thing or a white thing. These were other human beings, you know what I'm saying, that were, that were struggling, uh, trying to make ends meet in, 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 in the most affluent nation in the world. And, and, and that's, that really hurts because this, 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 this nation is, 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 is so, you know, so much in this nation, man, it's enough for everybody. And, and, and for certain people to have to live like that, I, I, I just take issue with that. Uh, I have, like I said, I got diabetes. My mother died of diabetes. My father died of diabetes. My oldest sister died of diabetes. My baby brother died of it. I got it. I lost two toes. You know what I'm saying? So I don't have a long time to go. But I've made the commitment that however long I got left, every breath in my body, I'm still trying to make life better for somebody else. I used to think a lot about me. You know what I'm saying? And, and when I went, and I think that's the change that took place after I went to that first meeting. Because it was just about me when I walked in that door to the first meeting. But by the time I left that first meeting, it was about somebody else. And I had never in my life cared anything about anybody else that wasn't a part of my family. And so this was big for me. I, I could feel something different happening inside of me. And uh, it felt good. And, 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 and I just wanted to share it with other people and, and to hopefully, hopefully get them. That is so eloquent, sir. That is such a great way to express what we're speaking about here. It's bigger than you, and you now are part of this community of, of people that are, don't look like you, but they are all experiencing the same injustice, exactly. the same hurt. And together, clearly, the answer is clearly, I'm not going to be able to fix this by myself. No. This has got to be a team effort here. Now, we can talk. Uh, unfortunately, we just don't have that much, that much time, but we, 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 we could learn more about how Mr. Hunter learned about McDonald's as a corporation making uh, $6 billion in profit and, and became um, you know, very knowledgeable about the industry in which he serves. But tell us a little bit about this national leadership thing. Um, uh, how does that work? How do you participate in that and, and, and you know, some details? Well, it's, it's the National Organizing Committee. Uh, each state has two members, kind of like that. We meet and we meet in, in each state. We may meet in Washington, we may meet in Detroit, we've met in Arizona, we meet all over the country and we go into different states to find out and to share what's working for us in Chicago, what's working in, in Florida. We all come together like twice uh, a year, sometimes more than that if we got big things going on. But we try to get together at least twice a year to kind of uh, brainstorm what's working. Uh, what, what are they doing that we aren't doing? What could we do that they aren't doing? Uh, uh, we found out in New York, they had a penny a, a, a penny day and they would go to McDonald's at, at 12 o'clock in the afternoon and they would take these bags of pennies and get in front of the line and pull all these pennies on the counter. And they're thinking, well, you pay us in pennies, so we're gonna pay you in pennies. But what that does is it offsets everything in there because they're working on time. You, they have 30 seconds to get you this and five seconds to get you that. Well, if you got to stand here and count 300 pennies for a pop, guess what? These people behind me have to go. They got lunch and it's an hour and they got to go. So they're leaving out the door. And, uh, and, 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 and that works. Or, or you have like different pop days where they just go in and, and, and just order pops and pop. 
Okay, we're losing you again. Um, so, um, can you tell us now what what is the what does fight for fifteen one? I, I mean, it sounds like it's fifteen dollars an hour wages for the fast food workers, right? Yeah. Okay, and uh, to, to to have a union represent you as a fast food worker. Fifteen dollars in the union. That's all we were asking for, you know, so that we could, you know, uh, uh, make sure that some of these assaults and, 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 and injuries are addressed properly. Okay, um, so uh, it's a, it's it's an amazing story from being the maintenance man uh, at a at a few McDonald's to being part of the national leadership of a worldwide movement. The fight for 15, ladies and gentlemen, is a worldwide phenomenon now. And I believe, Mr. Hunter, you've been to other, another country or something? I think it's yeah. not just America, right? Yes, we've been to Brazil. I've been to Brazil. Uh, they have, they're really strong over there. We went to Europe. We've been in Europe. Uh, they make uh, $20 an hour in, in Europe. And, they, and, and, a, and a Big Mac costs pretty much the same as it does here. And I, and, and I wonder why are the Europeans paid $20 an hour by a corporation that's established here in this country and live under the protection that our military provides, but they're paying the workers in Europe $20 an hour. They have maternity and paternity leave. These are McDonald workers. You know, the men taking off work, they're getting vacations. And, and, and so what, why is it such a disparity over here? Why do we struggle so hard trying to take care of our kids and provide for them, you know, uh, it, it's ridiculous. And so, and so, yes, I stood up and, and, and we really haven't gotten to 15 yet, but we're still pushing uh, because by the time we get to 15, we're probably going to need 25. So, you know, as long as I got breath in my body, I'm going to be fighting this fight. Maybe not for 15. Uh, I'm finding myself now more and more fighting just to live or going around organizing just to live. Uh, 10 of us are slated to go to Georgia next week uh, to do some organizing up there with, with this election thing coming up. So we, we got together and it's 10 of us leaving here in that way uh, to try to help that situation out. But like I say, organizing is, is, is something that if I don't believe in it, I can't, I can't, I can't teach it. To, I can't give it to anybody else. I got to believe what I'm doing. I got to be committed to what I'm doing. I got to care about people other than me. Because like I say, I, I you know, I, I probably ain't got no more than five or six, seven years left. Be that as it may, I'm going to give every single day of it to helping somebody else and try to make this world a little bit better place for my baby girl to grow up in. Yeah. Well, um, that is an awesome testimony. Uh, let's open the floor to questions from the interns of Cycle 47. Hello, questions? I, I have a comment. Uh, I, uh, uh, Mr. Hunter, I just want to thank you for being a way maker, uh, agents of change for a social change. I appreciate your passion and your dedication you are very uh motivating and inspiring so thank you thank you thank you sir thank you I'm trying to get some help out here we need it yes yeah, same here um <laughs> i wanted to also give my um my acknowledgement for what you've done i mean here at ic stars i feel like we're fighting a similar fight where we want to create a better uh, create um, a better way for minorities and within the workforce, especially in corporate America, where we have to fight for our equitability as well. So we definitely appreciate you for, um, for, for, for influencing those, especially those, um, you know, cause minorities usually out of high school, they usually have to, they usually do start out in the fast food service or, or food service regardless. So I, uh, we thank you for taking this step of, you know, building more equity for for us especially within the fast food business where we we where most of us start out um a lot of us within the cycle uh a few of us in the cycle have actually started out within the food service or had to work in the food service for 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 quite a while so we definitely thank you for that thank you 
You're welcome, bro. You're welcome. First off, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Hunter. Um, just for stepping up to your destiny, you know? I feel like that you understood that big moment when you finally got in front of those 150 people and you wrecked and you made that connection. I think that was that seed was planted then and it's just been growing every, every day since that since that situation. And I do believe that everyone has a, um, a day with destiny. Uh, I wanna thank you for stepping up to the plate also to be a single father. I'm a single father as well. I have a, a, a three-year-old son. So I connected with you on that. I wanna just thank you again, bro, just for, that's, it, I know how hard it is. And for you to come this far with your daughter, bro, I, I, I gotta continue to thank you for that. And thank you for not only looking out for your, your children, but for the rest of our children they might have to work in those organizations, just fight for our uh, equity, just to be treated, treated the same and have the same resources. So thank you. You're welcome, bro. Um, question. Um, Chicago has a very interesting restaurant um, dynamic as having some of the largest uh, population of restaurants and uh, the most wide variety of uh, circumstances involved. Have you been uh, acutely aware of like the um, gig economy uh, uh, situation since you started with the Pipe 15? As it, as you've been, have you been able to see um, many of the things that go on in the majority of the restaurants in? Oh, hello, can you hear me? Okay. Um, have you been able to see most of what happens with the uh, restaurants in uh, City of Chicago? Uh, can you hear? Did, did you hear the question, Mr. Hunter? Uh-uh. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Have you been able to talk to um, many of the restaurants in Chicago, like in, abroad, like in the city, downtown, and other places? No. No. Uh, we um, to, I tried to talk to the guy that run the restaurants here in the city, uh, uh, but they didn't, they didn't want to go talk any at all, you know? And so our thing was more or less with McDonald's, you know, I, I try to centralize it because initially that's where we started out at, you know, uh, I didn't believe that a lot of the smaller places like the mom and pop joints could really handle a $15, you know, increase in minimum wage. But I knew that McDonald could, you know, I knew that the people that I was working for, and that was our initial move was at McDonald's. A lot of mayors and governors and different people got involved and it was politically uh, advantageous for them to increase the minimum wage. And, but, but that hurt a lot of smaller businesses, you know, uh, at the mom and pop joints because they can't sustain that, you know. And so a lot of them had to close, which wasn't, which wasn't where we were headed. But McDonald's decided that they would they would decimate mom and pop before they would, you know, actually give us what they're already giving uh, the Europeans over in Europe. And uh, that was like a kind of like a slap in the face, you know. And so, uh, yeah, but I, I have had contact with a lot of them, but uh, not many, not many. I, I, I try to deal with a lot of the people. Yeah, I put in, yeah. I put in the chat um, some statistics, guys. The fast food or what they call limited service restaurants made uh, 234 billion dollars in sales in 2017. So we're talking about Hardee's, you know, uh, Arby's, McDonald's, etc., Burger King. But at the same time, 52% uh, of fast food workers receive public assistance. Yeah. So that is to say, you could work over half of the people who work in the fast food industry, maybe working big, big hours, big shifts, but they're still not making enough for hand for for. To make ends meet and so they must go on public assistance so america we americans are subsidizing the fast food industry by 153 billion dollars a year because th these companies are not paying adequate wages not to mention of course no medical benefits no medical benefits so i'm so in the tresser family we're split up about whether we want to patronize a mcdonald's or a hardee's or pizza hut knowing that so we don't we don't want to give business to a company that isn't paying its its people fair wages, but that in the end might actually hurt people. So we're we're not sure what to do. 
other mm -hmm. than support the five for 15. <laughs> uh, there, I was thinking about this because there are a lot of smaller independent restaurants that similarly have problems because they just have financial issues being able to pay salaries and um, um, uh, wages. But I did also work for Lettuce Entertain You brands, which okay. are a multi-billion dollar corporation. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is that I think there may be an opportunity to see the equity in making a system that works for every single ent individual entity, meaning building and structure the laws or the ways of we fight for them in a sense that it is advantageous for them to deal equitably with each individual. And so that if you have a union, like Uno's Pizzeria had a union membership for like a, an independent union membership that their servers were into, and they were able to do that. The original Pizzeria Uno's is 115 years old in downtown Chicago. Yeah. They accepted union membership. Uh, but that was because they were basically uh, – there, there was a legacy people. They they forced it. They were able to um, talk to their their heads and mm -hmm. found an equitable solution. I I think there is something there. There's an opportunity to find a way to incorporate the unity of giving more to the actual in, in, institution of the restaurant, so that way they can provide for their employees, and then be able to use that as a means of bringing all of those entities together. For a collective bargaining unit to go in a, and address the the overarching concern for mm -hmm. all workers to get a fair wage, fair health care, um, fair uh, per, uh, leave and time off and compensation for everything that they need, so that way no one is left behind. See, the problem I think I think it's a, a bigger part of the problem with a lot of the big restaurants is that uh, we we try to talk and uh, but they're like uh, it it. When you get like McDonald's, they they really basically franchising out everything, and so it's these franchises that are standing between the workers and the corporation, and so the franchises are saying, uh, 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 you know, I've talked to a lot of franchise owners that say, hey man, they forcing us to buy McRib. Everybody don't eat McRib. You know what I'm saying? Our neighborhood we may not eat a lot of McRib. I like real ribs. I don't like imitation ribs. You know, and so. In our community, they don't eat a lot of them. But the corporation will send the franchise that I was working, 85 boxes of them, and we got to move them in two weeks. And, and if they, we don't move them, we got to throw them away. And so the owner sat there, the franchise owner sat there and talked to him. And I'm sitting there, and he said, I don't need them. We don't sell them. They said, we're sending them anyway. You know what it's I'm like saying? It's like when kids are being told to sell all the stuff in school. It's their franchise the same way. There's got to be some crossover where you can find out what law's being misappropriated and, and, and find a way to make it equitable and use that as a rallying cry because I'm, I'm just – it seems like opportunity has struck me alongside my, my sadness for what we're going through. It's mm -hmm. I've seen people suffer in the middle of my own restaurant where people are making decent wages, but they're not enough. Somehow, some way, it's never enough, and they they, they know that, and they don't care. Yeah, it's it's and, and, and see that's where that passion comes from for me. Uh, I try to stick with the people, you know, and stay dealing with the people, and let the people know what they're capable of doing. You know what I'm saying? And 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 because when I move up and try to deal with a lot of the the owners and the different uh, people like that, it's like they don't they they got one track mind, and it's making money. You know, and then they'll ask me, well, how are we supposed to do it? I don't know how you're supposed to do it. I'm, I'm, you know, I got a, I got two years of college. You know what I'm saying? I don't have an economic degree or anything. And so my thing is I'm going to, I'm going to put pressure where I can put pressure. At. Uh, I know we got electricity. I plug my TV up. It works. I don't know how it works, but I know when I plug it up and I pay my bill, it works. So there's some pretty smart people around here that invented this stuff called electricity. And if we can invent electricity, surely we can put food on every table in this country for every child. And, and, and I may not be the best thinking per person to come up with that, you know, uh, because I got a lot of other things that I'm dealing with. But I'm sure it's some minds. I look at the bridges and the buildings and, the, you know what I'm saying, the, the submarines and stuff that we have made, that man has made. If we can make that, 
we can we can deal with this problem. We can put food on every table in this country. We can provide a quality education for every child in this country. You know, health care. You know, we can do this, man. If we see these bridges and we look at how tall these buildings is and how deep into the ocean we can go in a, in a submarine, we can do whatever we want to do. So we should not be living like this here in rat infested, roach infested, lice infested, lead infested, slums and ghettos and barrios all over this world, man. We just got to stand up. People got to stand up. And a lot of times, it, early I was afraid because I got that daughter. What's going to happen to her? But somewhere along the line, we got to ask the question, what's going to happen to them if I don't stop by? I could have probably been some, I could have probably been a speaker somewhere. But this is where God put me. And I often ask myself, why did he stop me down here on the bottom? I'm pretty intelligent. Why am I down here? You know what I'm saying? And, and, and maybe it's to pull somebody else up that's down here. Maybe that's why it got me down here. Because I've been off a job, but I, I, I can't give it up now. I'm committed to this. I'm committed to seeing life better for, 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 for a lot of people, man. Yes, bro. So what can we do to be a part of your mission? Like, How can we help with that? Uh, take action. Get involved. Uh, if, uh, John Lewis said it, all, uh, said it best. When you see something, say something. If you see something wrong, do something about it. You know, if we, we can't just keep being afraid to, to, to step out here and say, that, ouch, that hurt. You know, no, you can't keep doing that. We're tired, man. It's been too many years, man. People shouldn't have to live like this here. And so my thing is, I, I go around and I organize people, but I organize people with my mouth. I talk to them and let them know. I, I understand where you at. I done lived that same life. I done walked in them same shoes. And I'm telling you, we can come up out of here if we just stand together. I spoke to a, a SEIU convention uh, the national convention they had here in Rosemont, and I spoke there, and uh, and uh, that was it, it, it's a lot of people, doctors, nurses, janitors, you know, all of these people uh, uh, wanting to see something better happen in this country. And so my thing is that's how I organize. I organize by going into these meetings and talking and and expressing myself and letting people know where I'm at, man. And, and what I think we're capable of doing now. It's going to take some bigger minds than mine to get it all together, but I think that I think we got enough bright people to get this together. Uh, any last questions before we have to head to round, wrapping up? Any last questions or comments? I just see it's all it's all stimulated and it's, uh, it's all surrounds social injustice. It's all uh, this America, the rich want to stay rich and keep the poor poor. But I feel like we all uh, all always internalize everything. We uh, just like you, Mister Mister Hunter, you you had to focus and 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 on yourself to to be open to and then receptive so i feel like it i hear rico want to know what can we do and, and, and my thing is I always like do get yourself together and, and, and put yourself in a better position so you can um you know you know help uh, uh, others e even if it's not in the capacity of of the fight for 15 you know we can do something mm -hmm. it may be just the neighborhood cleanup you know what i'm saying as long as you're doing something you know what I'm saying? And don't just lay down and give up, you know, with that apathy and despair, because, you know, that, that, that kind of like paralyzes your will, you know, and, and, and we have to stay active and uh, we have to keep our eyes on the prize, man. It's keep attainable. Our eyes. Keep our it's eyes on the over. prize. It's not over. Well, as you know, Mr. Hunter, IC Stars is about creating leaders for the future. And, uh, um, you know, what would be your, 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 your parting comments to this, to this group of uh, leaders in training? Okay, well, I, I, I would like to share a poem with you all this morning. Uh, okay. And the poem is, it was written by James Russell Lyle. Um, and it goes kind of like this. To every, to every man and nation, comes the moment to decide 
in the strife of truth and falsehood for that good or evil side. Some great cause, God's Messiah, offering each the bloom or blight. And the choice goes by forever, twixt the darkness and the light. Though the cause of evil prosper, yet his truth alone is strong. Though our portion be the scaffold and upon the throne be wrong, yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. I, I love what y'all are doing. I love how y'all are doing it. Get as much education as you can and try to help somebody with it, man. No, don't just try to be rich with it. Try to help somebody else with it, man. With whatever education, however far you go, try to reach back and grab somebody else and pull them up there with you. If it ain't number one, somebody else. And I thank y'all, man, for having me here today. The pleasure was ours. Thank uh, you. One last thing before we close out, uh, Mr. Hunter, do you mind taking a photo with us? No. How do I do that? I'll, I'll take care of it for you. No, no worries. <laughs> All right, so uh, computer savvy man, I get you know, we got other people that work these computers, but it's, it's teamwork for to make the dream work. So, uh, okay. cycle 47, when we think about Douglas Hunter's plight to help us out, what one word comes to mind? Right. Power, power, I like yeah. that, I like that. All right, so uh, as you know, how we do it on three, a big smile and a power, one, two. Three. Power. Power. Okay. All right. I need everybody on mic. We got to send Mr. Hunter off with a great big Cycle 47 Chicago hand clap. Awesome. Thank you so Thank much, Mr. Hunter. Thank you, Douglas. We really appreciate you. We, we really appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Really? Yeah, this is my first time. <laughs> really? so I couldn't tell. <laughs> we'll look forward to having you in the future. Good to see you, Take care, Mr. Hunter. Thank you, Douglas. Goodbye. Peace. Well, cycle 47, uh, we're reaching the end of our time together. What did y'all think about Mr. Hunter? He was actually um, a, a man of uh, the people and he just represented his uh, family and they got to where he needed to go based on his uh, ingenuity and it was something strong. He was very powerful. Uh, even like we watched his YouTube and he his delivery, it was like I knew he was an activist who was passionate, but just hearing him and sitting and having a conversation with him, his passion definitely is uh, prevalent and, and, and powerful. <laughs> so just reminding, he was, he was a maintenance man at McDonald's and he decided to step up even though it potentially could have ruined his life. And his daughter could have been taken from him had he lost his job. He didn't know what the consequences would be. And this is called wake, making the path by walking it, which is a hallmark of a lot of the work that we do. And it's actually a hallmark of some of the technology work sometimes that you do. You, you're doing things similar to the past, but not exactly as you create new things in your space. So we, we, we say, um, thank you, Mr. Hunter, for, for your courage. And then he taught us that you can't do anything by yourself. It must be done in collaboration with your colleagues and your fellows and especially social change. And he's been at this now for five or six years and it hasn't been solved. Uh, McDonald's has not given in to their demands though they could easily do so. So the work is not over, uh, but yet he persists. And also now he is a national and international leader, right? So, so what a leader looks like you know, you might want to think about that. Um, had you bumped into him in the grocery store, <laughs> you know, three years ago, would you have known, would you have thought, my, this guy is an international social justice leader who is known by, by all the peers at the top of the game, like the people who made Black Lives Matters, uh, Reverend Barber of the People's Movement, they all know Douglas Hunter. They all know him. So that's something to be mindful of. Okay, folks, our, our next session, we take um, two weeks off. We convene two weeks from now and you will have, be doing your presentations. 
So there's instructions on the class website and everybody should have been mailed, uh, emailed a PDF with the instructions. Are there any questions about your final projects, about what, what is involved? Good, everybody's cool. That was the All email, right. that was the email, I'm sorry, Tom. Yeah, um, I think Paige might've sent it out um, earlier this morning with a PDF. Oh, yeah. Check Thank your email. You. Um, so reminder, it's a five minute presentation based on issue 95 of Yes Magazine. All the links are online. Um, please practice. You will be timed on your presentation and the content expectations are again on the document and on the website. And a reminder what a good presentation is, it is not reading the text of what you're showing us. So go light on the text and strong on the images and use the presentation as a backdrop for telling us a story. So you gotta be comfortable. And if you need notes, that's fine, but run through it one or two times so you can sort of look at us, tell the story with a PowerPoint backing you up. Um, I will manage the PowerPoint so everyone will see it and you'll just say next slide, please. So I'll be like your human clicker. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. Um, much love, uh, stay sane, stay strong, stay safe. We'll see Thank you. you Thank you, Tom. Have a good Tom. week. Have a good two Bye -bye. weeks. A pleasure as usual, Mr. Tressa. All right, everybody. Day.